Um, all right, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, it's really exciting to be here because I'm basically in the middle of transitioning, um, as you just heard, uh, from one or very different role to a new one. Um, so up until about four months ago, I was running a neuroscience research lab at a nonprofit research institute outside of Washington, D.C. called Genelia Research Campus. And just about four months ago, I joined uh, yeah, this really exciting new initiative called uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And what I want to do today in my talk here is share with you uh, some ideas and really hopefully kind of a vision for how technology can accelerate the practice of science. And I want to tell you that, that those ideas, uh, as they're informed by the kind of work I was doing um, in my lab and the kind of tools we were trying to build, and then how that's affecting how I'm thinking about what we're going to try to do as part of this initiative. So to start, oh, where's my thing? OK. Uh, to start, I'm going to tell you about the kind of work I was doing at Genalia. So I ran a computational neuroscience lab. And what that meant is I worked collaboratively with lots of other groups at Genalia um, who were developing incredibly cool experimental technologies for neuroscience. And one of those technologies I'm um, showing here. So in many of these projects, we were interested in understanding the relationship between brain activity and behavior and how the brain enables complex behavior. So here is one such complex behavior. This is a task we developed with a mouse. Um, and the mouse is in what we call the tactile virtual reality environment. So mice, uh, unlike us, explore the world mainly through their whiskers instead of their eyes. And in this setup, the mouse is on a ball and is running on the ball. And in order to create the experience of being inside an arbitrary environment, we put walls on either side of the mouse. And the walls are on little motors that move around as the mouse runs on the ball to create the experience of being inside basically a maze. And you can see over on the right is the position of the mouse within this virtual environment that we're creating with these walls. And on the left, she's running around and exploring this world. Now, the reason we have to create a virtual environment is that we want to be having mice perform complex behaviors in these kinds of experiments while they're not actually physically moving so that we can record their brain activity with really large microscopes that go above their head. So if we zoom out a little bit, uh, that ball over there is where the mouse is running. And this is an incredibly large microscope on top. Um, the little head over on the right is uh, uh, my former postdoc, Nick Safranyev. Um, and all of this work was a collaboration with Carl Sabota's lab at Genalia and, and, and led by Nick. Um, so this is an incredibly cool new microscope developed at Genalia called the Mesoscope. And it allows us to measure brain activity while a mouse is doing this kind of complex behavior um, where we're interested in things like how the mouse perceives the world and how do they learn and how do they navigate. And what we see with this microscope are patterns of brain activity across uh, potentially tens of thousands of neurons at once. And that's what we're looking at in this movie. So all these little flashing spots are individual neurons. And we're tracking their activity because these mice are genetically encoded or engineered um, to have their neurons express proteins that light up when the neurons are active. So by capturing this movie, we can actually watch patterns of brain activity while animals are performing complex behaviors and try to understand the relationship between that activity and the behavior. That results in uh, maps like this, where uh, in this particular case, we're basically color coding neurons based on their relationship to particular properties of the world that the animal was experiencing. Um, and this is the kind of science we were doing. This is just one example of probably about five or 10 that I could have told you about incredibly cool technologies uh, being developed now in neuroscience and across basic biology in general to enable us to look at things that we've never really been able to look at before. You know, before this microscope was developed, we could never watch uh, what we're watching here. What I was really struck by across all the different collaborations I got involved in, where my role was really uh, to help both design the experiments and then make sense of the data, is that despite all these incredible technologies we have access to, uh, most of biology, or a lot of biology, is really limited and bottlenecked by the ways in which we process and work with uh, data and disseminate our knowledge. Um, and one way to think about this, uh, that I, uh, or sort of one thing I heard a lot from the groups that I worked with, is that labs that used to spend about 80% of their time doing experiments and 20% of their time sort of working with data and dealing with the data. Uh, now it's the other way around. They spend 80% of their time just managing and moving data, and not in sort of like a cool way, like, yay, data analysis, more moving disks from one drawer to another, or sort of dealing with infrastructure that they don't really understand to try to store and process all of their data. And I think this is a really widespread issue. And I think part of it is that we come into the problem of data analysis, I think, in a lot of science, thinking that it's going to look something like this. We have data, and then we do some stuff with it, and we have our results, which we share with the world. 
but probably as many people here are familiar with, uh, the reality looks a little bit more like this. Um, there's this incredibly complicated uh, uh, set of things that have to happen to make sense of the data we're collecting. And the reality from sort of being on the ground and working with lots of labs is that basically every lab comes up with their own sort of messy version of this picture. Um, and every lab is doing it almost more or less independently. So there's a lot of reinvention. And because each lab sort of comes up with their own way of working with data, it's very hard to share and reuse uh, things that have been used in one group to other groups. It's also very hard for us to reproduce each other's work. Um, so as a result, we have lots of reinvention and lots of forms of, of both experiment and analysis that are very hard to reproduce. So my lab at Genalia, um, despite trying to basically just do neuroscience research, ended up thinking about this problem a lot. And I'm not going to go into to detail. I'm going to sort of compress you know, three or four years of work into a single slide. But really, what we ended up working on were ways of trying to make the process of doing neuroscience more efficient, more effective, and more collaborative. So we were working on a variety of different tools, mainly software, um, for doing things like large-scale data processing and organizing data, visualizing it, lots of tools for web-based uh, visualization, sort of interactive computing, and uh, dissemination. And we did this in close collaboration with lots of groups at Genalia that were trying to solve these problems. And I think we, we both learned a lot about the brain and, uh, in the process, helped a lot of aspects of how science was practiced and how neuroscience was practiced. Um, but in the process, we started to realize, or certainly I think in our group we realized, that the problems we were working on, uh, as perhaps should have been obvious, are really not specific to neuroscience. These issues are, uh, at the very least, relevant to all of biology um, and probably all of science. So although this is sort of what we thought we were working on, um, really the question is, how do we make all of science more effective more efficient and more collaborative. Um, and this was sort of a realization that came to our group uh, uh, a few months ago. And it was really exciting uh, to, in that moment, uh, that happened right around the time I saw the announcement about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, so this is Corey Bargman um, during the announcement. Corey Bargman is the president of Chan Zuckerberg Science. And she is the leader of our very small but rapidly growing team. Uh, I joined uh, basically right after she did. Um, and uh, to give a little bit of context about the initiative as a whole, it was started about a year and a half ago um, by Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. Um, and the initiative as a whole uh, was focused initially as a philanthropy around education. And it was about four months ago that they decided to have an entirely separate, or they announced that they were having an entirely separate initiative focused on science. And the mission of the initiative is to support basic science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Now, if you're like me, uh, this seems kind of like a crazy goal. Um, and uh, I think in many ways it is. Um, I think, for one thing, it's good to have crazy goals because uh, it gives you something to look towards. Um, but perhaps more importantly, if I instead said that we were going to try to achieve these things in 1,000 years, it might not seem quite so crazy. So then the question is, how do we take something that's going to take 1,000 years and make it happen in 100 years? And to me, the answer goes back to two things. One um, is this idea of basic biology. Um, we can't cure something we don't understand. And there's a lot about biology that we still don't understand and we need to understand. So we need to find ways to support basic science. And second is that there's an enormous opportunity, I think, to use uh, especially software and technology to make the process of doing science and make what scientists already do more efficient, more effective, and more collaborative. So we, um, in this initiative, are just getting started. My role is really to sort of develop things we're doing at the intersection of computation and biology. And right now, we're in a process of just ramping up. We are actively listening to the community. Right now, we're holding workshops um, focused on different areas. And we're trying to identify areas where we think we can hopefully have uh, a unique impact and sort of uniquely contribute to the efforts of the scientific community. Um, and again, I think an area where we're most excited to, or we think we can have a unique impact, is where technology intersects with science. Um, so one thing that's really interesting about the initiative we're developing is that uh, we have scientists, um, and we're going to be funding science. But we also have, within the initiative, a, a very large, or, or rapidly growing, uh, software engineering team. And uh, that team is going to be working both on actually developing tools and technologies for things like data analysis and data visualization. Um, and it's also going to be, be working collaboratively with, uh, in, a, in a totally open way, um, with the scientific community and with computational researchers in the community 
to, again, to build tools, to develop infrastructure for things like analysis and visualization and sharing and ultimately dissemination of knowledge. So again, we're just getting started, um, literally just for a few months. Um, but what I want to do uh, in the remaining time here is share with you just a couple projects that we're starting um, that are just getting ramped up right now. Um, so these are very much in progress. And again, we're really just in the process of, of listening to and learning from the community. Um, so the first project uh, is, is, as a whole, something that, that uh, we didn't start. It existed before. Um, and it's a really exciting, really ambitious effort called the Human Cell Atlas. Um, so you can learn about it more at humancellatlas.org. Um, this is an international collaborative project. Um, it includes many, many groups, including um, EBI and Sanger from here in the UK, um, who we just visited a couple months ago. Um, also the Broad Institute in Boston, um, Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, um, and many, many, many other labs. Um, there was just a big conference we co-organized in Stanford, um, and there's going to be more throughout the year. Um, so this is sort of a federation of groups that are working towards a really exciting goal, which is to build a comprehensive uh, reference map of all cells in a human and for that reference atlas to provide a basis both for understanding of basic biology, um, but also understanding of disease. Um, it turns out, although we know a lot about different organs and we know a lot about different tissues, um, there's a lot we don't know about just the fundamental differences um, that distinguish different cells from one another, or even in some organs, how many cell types there are, um, including the brain, which is an area I thought about a lot. Thought about a lot. Um, and there's a lot of really exciting technologies that are just now enabling us to do this kinds of large-scale categorization of cells throughout the body. So uh, as part of our initiative, we're looking to uh, really just support and accelerate this project, especially as it gets off the ground. So two ways we're doing that, again, to sort of reflect our two, uh, two different kinds of approaches we take. Um, one is that we have a RFA that is uh, actually our first RFA, uh, Request for Applications. It's coming March 15th. And what we're soliciting here are pilot projects for the Cell Atlas. And our goal with this is really to accelerate the development of technologies that are going to be critical for creating this reference. Um, there's a lot of different ways right now to characterize uh, and sort of comprehensively map cells. Things like single cell RNA sequencing, it's a genomic technique, to look at transcription profiles. Um, there are image-based methods, um, actually some really cool new image-based transcriptomic approaches. Um, there's also things like proteomics and a whole bunch of other techniques that probably haven't even been invented yet. Um, so our goal really with this initial uh, uh, RFA is to support the development of those technologies and also do things like establish best practices and comparisons between different techniques. Now again, sort of thinking about what, what's maybe unique that we can bring alongside the funding of this science, we're working with a, a, a lot of different groups to help develop ideas about how to organize and share the data that comes from this project in as open a way as possible. So uh, this was a joint effort with, with us and uh, the Cell Atlas group itself, as well as EBI, Broad, uh, UC Santa Cruz, and we're increasingly bringing others into the mix um, to develop a, 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 what is basically the diagram up here. Uh, it's a plan for how to share data as part of this project. It includes ingestion, organization of the data, analysis, and dissemination. Um, and the two real principles that we're trying to bring to this, one is openness. We want to make this reference as widely available to the scientific community as possible and to build a system for that. And the second is, is modularity. We want to build uh, a system. This is incredibly complex because we're going to have hundreds of labs putting data into this thing. And we want to build it in such a way that it can extend over time. These techniques are going to evolve. The analyses are going to evolve. And we need the system to be able to grow. So we're using principles like modularity and separation of concerns to build it. Um, and this is all going to be done as open source and made available both in terms of the data but also the code to the scientific community. Um, second thing, very quickly. This is an area that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I showed you before this incredibly cool movie of uh, the brain uh, uh, capturing patterns of activity in the brain with microscopy. Um, there's a lot of other things we can do with microscopy as well. Um, this is an incredibly cool example uh, from something called the Lattice Light Sheet Microscope, um, which was actually developed at Genalia by Eric Betzig's lab. This uh, video is from Bai Cheng Chen and Wesley Legant. Um, this is a movie of a T cell uh, literally attacking and engulfing an antigen presenting cell. And in watching this movie uh, with high resolution in space and time, we're literally watching something that up until now was a cartoon in a textbook that we didn't really understand and we couldn't really observe. Um, so this is incredibly cool technology that lets us watch things we've never been able to watch before. Uh, at the same time, how to actually process and quantify these kinds of data and not just look at them as movies is incredibly difficult. 
Um, and actually, just a couple weeks ago, we had a workshop where we had some of these folk um, and also sort of the leaders of deep learning developments at Google. And I showed this video to one of the deep learning Google people, and they were like, whoa, I have no idea what to do with that. Um, <laughs> and the reason is that you know, we're not sort of recognizing objects here. The problem of quantifying these kinds of movies is incredibly complex. You know, we want to get intuition about things like the velocity and the dynamics of these processes. These are very hard things to model. Um, so I think it's a really exciting area, and we're just looking now at how we might be able to support the development of tools and technologies for uh, processing these data. And the very last thing is uh, an area that uh, is also something very near dear to my heart, which is how we disseminate knowledge in science. Um, so despite all the incredibly cool technologies you've heard about throughout this conference, the fact is we still disseminate most scientific knowledge uh, using a format invented in the 20s. Um, or even before, which is a single static scientific document that has some figures and has some text, um, and that's it. And that's how we disseminate all of knowledge. It's a PDF document, right? And we print it out on paper. Um, there's a lot that science is that's not captured in these documents. There's data, there's code, it should be interactive, it should be reproducible. Um, there's a lot of cool technology out that's trying to get at some of these things. This is an area we're exploring and we hope to support. Um, the other side of putting content out is how to discover it. Um, and uh, to that end, um, we actually just recently acquired a company called Meta, who are going to be joining us. And they've been building some really cool artificial intelligence-based approaches to organize and search the scientific literature. Um, and now that they're part of our team, we're going to be able to make everything they've developed openly available to the scientific community. Um, so that's just in the process of happening. But I'm super excited about it. I think they've done incredibly cool work. And I'm really excited to see what they'll do as part of our effort. So thank you very much for listening. Um, you can check out that link to hear more, and uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards.